May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the other day, I got to see Jesus. Okay, well, since I was talking on the cell phone, technically, I guess I'd have to say, I talked with Jesus. I didn't see him. You see, many years ago, I became a big sister to a, a beautiful, sweet, nine-year-old girl. And through the years, we traveled together. Her children lived with me. I gave her way too much money. In essence, we shared life together. But through the years, Angie made a series of bad choices, leaving her homeless, beaten, under the influence of drugs, losing custody of her children. You name it, she probably experienced it. With no known address, no phone, we eventually lost touch. But on April 12th, her birthday, I thought I would reach out to the one phone number that I thought might still work, and that was her daughter. Imagine my surprise when I found out that it worked, but not only that, but Angie was actually there in her daughter's apartment that very day. Tears ran down my face when I heard that precious girl's voice, when I heard her laugh. And what she said was even more amazing, because despite all the trauma that surrounded her life, Angie was filled with hope. She had been talking with a college professor about opening her own business. She was going to turn her life around. Now, I don't know if she can or will, but that hope, that love that Angie still carries in her heart is Jesus. The other day, I talked with Jesus. And that's the message which we hear in our gospel reading, talking with Jesus, seeing and recognizing Jesus. In our reading, Luke shares a snapshot of Jesus' journey. Journeying is a prominent motive in, motif in Luke, whether in gospel or acts. Jesus is always walking, going. In fact, this first self-designation for early Jesus followers was not Christians, but followers of the way. Thus, presiding Bishop Curry's excellent book and the Episcopal Church's invitation, The Way of Love. The Lucan focus on travel, both literally and figuratively, is a metaphor for discipleship, following in Jesus' footsteps. And so today, we walk with Jesus. And in our story, we hear lots of details. Why is that? What day is it? Still Easter morning. How many were there? Two disciples. Where were they going? Emmaus. Where's that? Well, it's about seven miles from Jerusalem. We hear all of these details because we are material people. We are incarnational people. We need to put skin on God's love in order to see it. We adore our sacraments because they are outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace. One place that we look for Jesus is in the material world. And so we hear of Jesus meeting the two disciples. And he asks them, what are they talking about? Now, I'm pretty sure that Jesus knew what they were talking about. But Jesus asked two times, what things? And one of the disciples answers, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Oh, my gosh. Did you not hear about the shooting, the earthquake? The war. Do you hear the disdain? The disbelief? In addition, this disciple, Cleopas, called Jesus stranger. In Greek, this is parokos. Okos meaning house, para, outside. He viewed Jesus as someone outside the house. Someone who lives in a country without citizenship. 
a foreigner or immigrant, someone outside his circle of like-minded people. Cleopas does not recognize that he is walking with Jesus. His head is filled with his own beliefs, his fully formed idea that Jesus is dead and his body is missing. Cleopas's views, his lenses on life, blinded him to the truth of seeing Jesus right in front of his eyes. Do you remember a few years ago there was a, a picture of a dress going viral? Did you think that it was white or gold when actually it was black and blue? Do you remember that? My favorite example is the picture of the woman. You've probably seen it sometime in your life, and you're asked, do you see an old woman or a young woman? Our experiences and beliefs train us to see one thing when someone sees something else. And yet both are correct. It's a picture of an old woman and it's a picture of a young woman. Some of my friends, and unfortunately myself also at times, see Angie as someone not worth the effort. She'll never change. But if I felt that way, I would have never experienced the joy of her laugh, the awe of her optimism and hope, the presence of Christ in the body of Angie. In the last couple of days, three gifted teens were shot for being at the wrong address or getting into the wrong car. Ralph Yar went to 115th Street instead of 115th Terrace. The owner shot him through his glass front door. Kaylin Gillis was in a car with three friends heading to another friend's house. They turned into the wrong property, and as they were turning their car around, the owner came out and fired two shots, killing Kaylin. And more recently, and closer to home, Peyton Washington mistook her car. And as she and her friend were apologizing and returning to their own car, a man shot them. Now, I don't know what these three shooters were thinking, but clearly it wasn't that someone was lost and needed help. The shooter's assumption caused irrevocable harm. So I wonder, what harm have our assumptions caused? I'm hopeful that no one here has literally killed anyone. However, have we been open, truly open, to seeing Jesus? Do we recognize that it is Jesus that we are walking with? Jesus at the door of the wrong address? Jesus and the folks who are living in the margins of society? Jesus and the stranger? Jesus, the one that is not like-minded? What stories are we telling ourselves? Do our discussions fuel the flames of bitterness, anger, injustice? A new study came out about millennials and the false story of their financial woes. It seems that financially, in many other ways, millennials are better off than previous generations. So why as a whole do they have a stereotype of woe is me? Well, according to the study, one of the causes is social media and its ability to glorify the biggest, the brightest, the best. Keeping up with the Joneses, or in this case the Kardashians, has never been more unattainable. And compared to the Kardashians, the millennials' assumptions then cause them to feel poor on a whole. This gospel message is a wonderful opportunity to look at the assumptions in your lives. What stories are you telling yourself? Who and what is influencing you? It's still Easter season. It ends on May 28th. We actually have 35 more days. And during that time period, I invite you to look at what you're discussing. How are you discussing it? What are you not discussing? What do you assume that maybe you shouldn't? 
because we are invited to see the world with lenses of faith, not our everyday assumptions. We are being asked to live into our baptismal vows, to seek and serve Christ in all persons. We are being asked to understand that the stranger among us just might be the bearer of good news. And that Angie, who may be just exactly what we think she is, poor, uneducated, maker of lots of bad decisions, is also the voice of Christ to us, awakening hope. And so my prayer for you, the next 35 days, and in the words of our colic, is this. Open the eyes of our faith that we, that you, might behold him. Amen.